Hi, this is Sean Dyer coming to you today representing a Civil War surgeon from beautiful central Ohio in my lovely backyard on a wonderful spring day. So any background noise that you might hear, some background scenes that you might see, uh, it's not a very formal place. We're not at a reenactment or anything. Uh, but just wanted to take this and see if maybe some people could learn from it and maybe find some interest in it. And before we get started, um, I am not a, an actual surgeon. I don't have any med formal medical training. First aid and CPR is pretty much the extent of it. But I'm an educator. I teach high school social studies and government currently. And uh, I've been researching the Civil War for a long time. I've been a reenactor for a long time. Um, so the knowledge that I'm presenting to you comes from those avenues. All right. Now, I'd like to thank my wonderful wife, my beautiful wife, my family, uh, for their constant support. I'd like to thank my students for keeping me on my toes, always. And I'd like to thank educators out there, no matter who you are, what level of education that you participate in. Even if you're a custodian or the lunch lady, I sincerely appreciate everything you do to educate others and be part of that mechanism. All right. So we are going to talk about living accommodations for an officer during the American Civil War. Now, when you're talking about the living accommodations, it really depends on when and where you're talking about uh, the rank of the officer and where the officer would be. So it varies. Generally speaking, though, um, if they had it available, they would use it. So sometimes when you're reading memoirs or diaries or letters or whatever, you'll see that officers were sleeping in someone's house or they were sleeping in a barn or a shed or they're hunkered underneath a tree when it's coming down rain and they're just trying to survive the night. So uh, the accommodations just depend. You know, it's like our current military. You know, when you're out in the field, when you're engaged in uh, war type experiences, you just do with whatever you can get as best as you can. Okay. Now I'm going to point out several sources that I use. Um, when trying to develop uh, details of minutia, like living accommodations. Now, I prefer memoirs, diaries, and journals to letters. The reason being is because letters they t tend to be more sentimental. Uh, I miss you. I love you. How's the kids? Uh, I heard that so-and-so got back home. Is everything okay? Is it recovering? Etc. The The three books that I'm going to present to you uh, specifically were really good resources for me to identify how an officer lived, specifically a surgeon, because that's what I represent. If you're going to represent an infantry officer, you need to read some infantry officer memoirs. If you're going to be, um, I don't know, a naval officer, then you need to read something from them. Okay, So this is specific to the medical field. And I'm going to go from the lowest of the totem pole to the highest. Now, my favorite, my favorite memoir that I've read yet, just because the amount, the tremendous amount of detail that the writer put in, put in it is uh, Dr. Wilder's memoirs. And he actually wrote two of them, or at least they were split in two. One was when he was a medical cadet in Washington, D.C., and that's the first memoir. So, and I would suggest you read him in order. That way you understand uh, his background and where he's coming from. So he served as a medical cadet in Washington, D.C. early on in the war. And then later he got a transfer and he passed the exam to be an assistant surgeon in the 55th Massachusetts, which is a colored regiment. And the one that I'm talking about today is practicing medicine in a black regiment by Surgeon Wilder. The next one in rank would be a surgeon's civil war. This is uh, written by Dr. Holt. Now, Dr. Holt is an interesting character. If you get a chance to read it, um, I think he complains a lot. I think he personally thinks he's better than those around him. Um, and you could tell that his experiences and his personality probably rub some people the wrong way. And uh, his sleeping accommodations are even going to be affected by that. Um, other officers are not going to be willing to help him out as much as, say, Wilder, who was extremely popular among his companions. And lastly, 
the one that I really like very well is the John H. Brinton Civil War Surgeon Personal Memoirs. Uh, now, John Brinton, a little bit of a background, he served as General Grant's, President Grant, uh, surgeon, personal surgeon in the West, and then he transferred to Washington, D.C. and to start the uh, Medical Museum. And um, then when Grant went back east he got to meet up with them but yeah it's kind of an interesting back and forth background about this brilliant man who uh, made tremendous strides in medical knowledge during the american civil war but in it he's very popular in it he talks about uh the minutia of where he's sleeping and at one point he actually uh sleeps in the same tent as General Sheridan when Sheridan was the quartermaster. And he uh, gives some detail about that and how cool of a guy Sheridan was. So those are the kind of things that you get from memoirs and from primary sources like them. So whenever you're building an impression or if you're just wanting to find more information, try to zero in on specifically what you're going for. And the more you read, the more detail you get filled out. All right. So I'm going to show you three sleeping accommodations um, that were issued to officers. Now, there's actually a few more accommodations that I don't personally own, so I can't show you. One of those is the Sibley tent. The Sibley was very popular early on in the war, and they were used even throughout the rest of the war during winter quarters, etc., or in uh, more stagnant camps. They're really big and unwieldy, hard to move around, and heavy. Uh, and the other one's the hospital tent. I have yet to get one. And someday, I hope to get one. Maybe. Eventually. It'd be nice. And really, the hospital tent is not something that your average officer would have slept in. So, the first one we're going to start with is what's called the common tent, or the A-frame, or the wedge. Now, Dr. Wilder, in his memoirs, specifically calls it the A-frame a few times, or the common tent, uh, in his memoirs. So we know that that term was specifically used, the A-frame. And this is it. It's called the A-frame because it's shaped like an A, as you can see. Not much to it, right? Um, so there you go. That's the common tent, the wedge tent, or the A-frame. Now, depending on what rank that you had, depends on if you'd have to share that tent with anyone. If you're a lowly assistant surgeon, then you're most certainly going to have to share that tent with at least one other soldier. With rank comes privilege, though. The higher rank that you are, the less likely you are to share that tent. Um, this next tent is going to be developed um, in 1862, late 1862 and in 1863, and there's definitely different varieties of it if you're really wanting to get into it. But this is called the um, shelter half tent, the commonly called the dog tent or the pup tent in modern terms, but is the shelter half uh, tent or shelter tent. And that is here. Now, as you can see, it's pretty small. Now, for this particular tent, each officer, even if you're a lieutenant, you were issued one entire tent, um, which is nice because it's not very big. I'm six foot one, and I had to decide which end is going to get wet or cold for the night. Um, so, and also for this particular example that I have set up, it's not set up in a common fashion. The poles that I have here were developed, they were patented, and they were supposed to be issued with the shelter half, but there's very little evidence that that ever really happened. Um, most soldiers would go and find branches or posts or something else to set up their tent. And there's a bunch of different ways to set it up, which is kind of fun. Especially if you like Legos, you can figure out new ways of setting up your shelter tent. And the more people that you have that are willing to go in together, uh, the more accommodous it gets. So if you're new to reenacting, uh, it's a good place to start. Just know that you're kind of uh, pigeonholing yourself in a particular set of years if you're wanting to go to a particular event that would be early war. This last tent is called a wall tent. And it's commonly called a cabin tent today, but it is traditionally called a wall tent. Now the wall tent looks like a cabin. As you can see, it's very large. Now, generally speaking, you would have a few officers that would 
possibly uh, stay in the wall tent. Um, the wall tents tend to be used more for uh, your higher up officers, not so much like lieutenants or captains. Um, Wilder, though, he actually mentions using the tent and its frame um, and carrying that around with him, especially when he's around Florida. And that's a colored troop. You know, they didn't necessarily always get uh, outfitted the best. So there's evidence that he, as an assistant surgeon, had access to the wall tent. Um, and several times he would talk about uh, having the entire tent to himself. Now, something to keep in mind if you're thinking that all officers had one of these tents is that he's a surgeon. Now, not only rank comes privilege, but professional also comes privilege. And doctors, for the most part, tended to get treated a little bit better, which is pretty cool if that's your impression that you're going to do. And even today, uh, surgeons and doctors have more respect than just your average, um, even white collared worker so um anyhow there you go that's the wall tent um and this is actually oh this is also set up traditionally how you would see it in pictures so you would have your wall tent here which is set up and then on top of it you would have your fly and um especially in the south and it gets really hot there's several examples written not a lot that are actually pictures, but there's several examples written that I've read between Brenton and um, Holt and Wilder that those tents would be set up with a fly, not on top of the tent, but as, say, like a porch for shade. And Wilder even talks about often, well, several times, that the wall tents were set up um, in a row, back to back or front to front, etc. And they would share that space and make it larger uh, for use of the officers. And if you're going to mess with a certain number of officers, that can be quite useful. And I'll talk about a soldier's mess or an officer's mess specifically in another video. Next thing I want to talk about is pegs. So when you go to a reenactment, you tend to see a lot of reenactors using steel pegs. Uh, was steel available? Certain, but steel is going to be pretty expensive. So that's something to keep in mind. And these type of pegs were not really used in service very much. Now the U.S. military would issue two different types of pegs. The first one is this type of peg. And this style was even used in World War One and World War Two. You can go on eBay and you can find old surplus World War Two pegs just like this. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. That's something you're interested in. Um, but it's made out of hardwood and that's what I use for my shelter half tent. You know, it's only about, uh, about a foot long. For my wall tent, because I like to be a little bit sturdier and there's evidence of another particular type of tent pegs that were used are these big boys. Again, this is another style that was used way up until, I don't even know if it may still be used in current military on tents, but um, it's very basic. It's hard wood, oak, shaped like so. It does the job. Um, they were using that World War One and World War Two as well. Again, you can get surplus Korean War vets use those kind of posts for their big tents. And that's what I have for my tents, as you can see. Um, and they work quite well. Uh, a little bit harder to jam in, but even with a really windy day, they don't come down. Uh, another thing I want to point out since I got the tent up is what's called the slips. So this here is a slip and it's made out of hardwood. This particular one is made out of walnut um, and it's shaped like a peanut. But any hardwood slip is what was used an inch by six inches long. Um, the reason why you would use the slips and you'd have them one inch instead of smaller is because it would grab with friction the rope and hold it nice and taut. These types of wooden slips were 
found on various sunken ships that sank during the American Civil War. The same thing with the different types of pegs. So there's some archaeology that came through that showed us exactly, specifically, what was used. Some primary sources. All right, so that's my video for um, the tents. Uh, officers would also regularly just sleep wherever they could. Um, Holt, Sergeant Holt, for example, several times, and he gripes a lot, he talks about being stuck underneath a tree when it's raining, or he talks about sleeping in an ambulance when he had an opportunity, or underneath an ambulance. Um, all three books discuss finding a house to sleep in, uh, or a shack, like, uh, or even a barn. Sometimes they would sleep in a barn. Um, anywhere you could lay your head. You know, it's just like today's military. If you're in a war conditions, if you can get some sleep after a long march or after a long ride, you're going to do it, no matter where you are. If you don't have the time or the energy to put up a tent, you're just going to crash wherever you can. Some detail uh, that I actually do want to add, I just remembered. When it comes to wall tents, there's a lot of evidence in Britain's book and in Wilder's book in the more permanent camps, um, where you're only moving like a few miles here and a few miles there. Wilder moves frequently, like once or twice a week, easy. And they always discuss finding lumber, either from an old military camp or getting lumber from the quartermaster or just going out and forging for lumber, and using that to floor their tents. That is something that's talked about significantly by Wilder, and it's mentioned quite a bit in... Uh, Britain's book. So that's something to keep in mind too. If you're a reenactor though, just carrying around the big old wall tent is kind of a pain enough than carrying around a whole low store full of lumber to make your accommodations more comfortable. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. If you have any questions, please send me a message. I'd appreciate it if you liked my video and if you subscribe it and share it. Pass the word. Um, if there's something specifically that you would want me to cover, especially when it comes to talking about officers, let me know, and I'd be happy to cover it if I can. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, give a kiss and hug to your loved ones. Keep them close, and I will see you guys next time. Take care.